Hey guys, Cam from Minky Knuckles here, coming at you on uh, Wednesday. I know we didn't do one last Wednesday, uh, but this Wednesday we have a very special uh, guest, one of uh, my favorite artists and one of my favorite people in comics, uh, an extremely interesting fella who has uh, some very interesting insight, a very cool background, and um, talent uh, beyond the cosmos, as you'll see tonight. Um, but without any further ado, Mr. Stefan Rue. How you doing, Stefan? I'm good, and you you make it rhyme. <laughs> That's a talent right there. <laughs> yeah, if I, anytime I do something like that, it's uh, inadvertent, to say the least. Um, how's the weather out your way today? It got better. It got better. We had three days that were really... Uh, Overcast and gray, and uh, which remind me, which reminded me a lot of uh, the weather in France, actually, in Paris, to be to be more specific. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, the weather over there is usually a, a good uh, a good uh, six month of overcast weather. Yeah, it, uh, well, it's at least you know some of the. Well, I know even out west in, in Canada here, I'm, I'm west, but not to the coast. And you get out to Vancouver and, and BC, and it's gorgeous, but same thing. Always overcast, oh, yeah, always that's rainy. Right. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. It reminded me when I was in uh, Seattle one year for a, a show there. Um, it reminded me a lot of Brittany, Brittany and Normandy. And you had that. Um, you call it uh, it's like that super fine rain oh yeah and uh, even though you have an umbrella it kind of like flies around underneath you always get you you feel the humidity yeah 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 no I we can... get that here in the summer you get the humidity yeah in the summer. Not that humid. yeah it gets a, a different kind of hot out your way in the in the summer doesn't it it's you know what it's not so much the heat i have friends in arizona and such who have like extreme heat we have like it's way it's over the 80 80s for sure but it's yeah. the humidity that kills me yeah i think that's you know i talk to uh, most people it seems to be the same thing but um what are you working on tonight sir tonight i'm working on uh the Silver Surfer. I'm actually, um, it's a little bit of an oversized piece. It's uh, 18 by 24 inches. You guys are with the metric system, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Even though mostly everything we we talk is in inches, anyways, but. Um, Certain things, we're, we're selective <laughs> on what, yeah. what system. Well, you, you, you can, yeah, you can uh, juggle with both, which is a good thing. Yeah, so this, um, yourself, Troy Nixie and Evan Cagle are all working on massive pieces for the same guy. Um, oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> so he's going to run out of wall space. I hope his uh, his fiance lets him get, uh, lets him have a little more wall space because uh, uh -huh. he's uh, he's gonna need it. But um, this, this is great. Do you um, and we'll, we'll get into a little bit more, Stefan. But because uh, I you know I recently talked about some of your your interests in comics and influences. Um, uh -huh. Is there historically have you read a lot of Surfer? Or are you big? Mobius fan or a big all red slot fan or is there a definitive cosmic run you're really interested in? Um, I like the concept of the character. I can't say I've been following the title um, steadily and uh, as a fan. I remember reading it when I was a when I was a kid. Uh, it was mostly, I remember vividly the, the issue with um, 
Mephisto and um, it was, I think it was John Buscema drawing it. And then I remember in the 90s, if I'm, if I'm correct, um, Ron Garney uh, drew him, I don't know if it was just passing by in another, in another book. I can't remember. It's, it, it seems like it seems like in another life. Yeah. It was in another life. Man. That's interesting because I seem to recall that as well. I don't don't recall exactly what that was. I was actually chatting a little bit with Ron today. It might be in a Captain um, America book, maybe. I'm not sure. Yeah. Well, that's good. I think I, I'm kind of with you. The concept of the characters always been an interesting one. I wasn't maybe huge on stuff in the past. I've always been a big Mobius fan, but the, um, mm -hmm. the Allred slot run that, that did it and the collector whose piece this belongs to um, the Allred slot slot run is, is really what got him into the character or which mm -hmm. took it to the next level. So it's, I really like that one for sure. Um, I must say I was back in the days when the, when the Mobius, book came out and that that might upset a lot of people who know me or or they might they might go like this guy doesn't get it but uh, i was a little bit disappointed with um with the one with uh the one mobius did because he had put so much work in so many other short stories that he did when I heard that he was doing one, I was like, oh my God, I hope it's like those Arzak illustrations and, you know, stuff like that. And it was, it felt like it was, I don't know if he put himself in the situation where it's comic book deadlines and he did it. He, he had such facility in drawing, you know, it was so easy for him without breaking a sweat that uh, I think in some of the finishes it shows a little bit yeah but the staging is perfect i mean you you get a sense of the gigantism of of galactus um, but there's it seems like there's a few uh, a few things that were taken like shortcuts i want to say and of course here in america it's the great mobius so of course, because he hasn't done too many forays into the characters that are are from uh, around here, it was it was a treat. It was definitely a treat to see what he could do with them. But I, I, I guess my expectations were were too high. I guess. Well, that that brings up an interesting point because, and my apologies if you can hear the piano in the background. <laughs> there's oh, there's funny. a music lesson suddenly taking place at the worst time possible at my house. But um, I, I was talking to Marcial Toledano, one of the, a Spaniard uh, on our roster. Marcial's um, doing a French book, Le Dominant. Or I, you know, I apologize for my butchering of the, the word, but um, I was talking to him about prospective projects and potentially, you know, doing a North American project. What would that take if that's what he's looking at? And, you know, obviously Marcel's open to a lot of things, but he, he made a comment too about uh, the deadline schedule, you know, in French comics versus North American. It, it, he made it sound like he had a lot more freedom and flexibility um, yeah, to put, put a lot more effort into his work. Mm -hmm. Is that common? Oh, it is. It, well, it's been common for the last 50 years. And uh, unfortunately, it's it's actually interesting because the French French Franco Belgian uh, graphic novel industry is trying to break down the process of uh, making a book. They are now um, going back to what they did at some point in the early in the sixties, stuff like that. You would have a guy do the layouts. Like the storyboard, yeah, and then you would have the guy drawing the pages. And back in the '60s, actually, mind you, there were a few uh, 
projects, products, products like um, detective stories or things that were in the vein of what Tintin looked like. And for a little while, it was studios working on those books. And you had the guy who specialized in drawing the vehicles. Um, you had the guy who specialized in drawing the backgrounds. Yeah. And they would actually participate in the book where the creator would work, would uh, would draw the characters. There was no inker. It was not like it was not broken down like it's in the U.S. for comics. It would be you would draw and you would ink your vehicles, but you had to you had to stick with a style, so it would not really pop out too much. And uh, so they were doing that in the '60s, and now they're trying to bring it back. Uh, in the industry when in comics there's more and more books that are managed completely pencil uh, layouts pencil and inks yeah by the same by the same creator creator well, it's it's interesting because you know special having that overly specialized for vehicles characters backgrounds it you, I just you worry about it lacking cohesion. Um, no, yeah, but the the guys were. It was kind of like a boot camp. You had to draw in a style that was approved by. Uh, I think in the case of I think in the case of Tintin, that was actually the case. There was a guy who ended up drawing his own uh, books that were more about uh, ancient Rome and he was the guy who would draw the backgrounds and then there was a guy who was into cars the cars from the 50s and he ended up he got he got handed a, a, a book with a, a detective like a film noir kind of stuff so eventually the reward was you would get your own book your own title hmm well i guess it's it's no different uh dave sim and and is it gerhard on uh Cerebus with those big elaborate backgrounds Gerhard did and dave okay. sim that uh, i really i love the look of any you know collab they've done um it makes sense uh, in the case because the, the, the backgrounds were so uh, impressive, you know, like the, yeah. the, the Octavio says uh, you did an amazing black cat for him many years ago, and it's still one of his favorite pieces. I'm guessing that was probably at Chicago. Um, could be New York. Could be New York too. Last Octavio, let me know which um, which show you picked that up at. Um, actually talking to Octavio earlier today as well about a variety of things but um, so See, Stefan that's, you, th yeah that's the kind of character black cat was the would be the kind of character that uh, I wouldn't have we had a conversation a little bit before it started and uh, that's the kind of character that when you have to when you get a commission of the character you you can go overboard on how sexy she can be. Yeah. But there are, there are other characters that they don't call for that at all. Yeah, Octavio's a big, he collects Black Cat and the Hulk. He's an oddball. Ooh. He's all over the map. And I, I imagine I, he likes the piece because he probably didn't put any white out on it. <laughs> I constantly I harass Octavio. Uh, there's a <clears throat> there's um a few years back well it's it's starting to make uh starting to count now but a few years back i started sculpting a life-size hulk bust that i had um in residence in a special effect uh, studio in uh, sacramento and i left it there 
for quite a while because I was only able to go whenever I had a, a show in California. So I sculpted a life-size bust and one time, and it was on, a, on an angle, on a table on an angle. It was kind of somehow rigged to it. Oh yeah. And I guess and I guess one day somebody either walked too close to the part of the studio where it was on the floor and it fell face down. Oh no. Yeah, and that's how I lost uh, that Hulk bust. We were we were considering um, making a, making a, a mold and cast it in silicone. And uh, and uh, have it like a, something you would have on display on the wall, and the frame would would seem like it would be custom framed. You would have three options: wood panels, uh, resin bricks, or just a drywall. Yeah. And it would seem like it would seem like he was he was crawling from inside the wall, like from through the wall. Yeah. There would have been a, a fist uh, sculpted too that would that would poke on the side, and you would just hang those. That would have been um, something really cool to see, but unfortunately, that sealed the fate. <laughs> the well, maybe Octavio can commission you for that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, uh, I have in my basement where where my new studio is going to be in a few months. Um, I have a Thanos bust that I've been working on for quite a while now. Uh, and it's been on hold because of uh, actual work. This is on the side just for fun. What well, I seem to recall when I first started following you on Instagram, or I think when I got first got Instagram years ago, I think yeah. um, right at that time you were posting mostly about a rocketeer sculpture you were doing or yeah, yeah. um this one's done um i just need to coordinate with a friend of mine and see how we can make a mold of this one because at some point i was um i approached uh, idw and people who have a connection with the estate and stuff and I haven't heard back so oh cool I, so I what just probably make a, a, a mold and a cast for my friends and whoever might be interested and that's it and it's it's the comic book version it's not the it's not the movie the Disney movie version yeah so it's the one with just one backpack uh, jet so pack, sorry. what um well, I, I don't know if Byron's on here. Um, well, and yeah, you know Byron Stefan. He's oh the, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's an avid fan of yours and the biggest Rocketeer collector I know of. Um, so I have a piece that, of works for him. Oh, nice. I, yeah, same, actually, same size as yeah, as one. the surfer. Oh man, mm -hmm. did we all miss the rest of us? Just we, the rest of us didn't get the memo that you were taking on these. Giant masterpieces. <laughs> um, I, I, I like to, depending on the, if it's a bust or if it's a head sketch, you know, it's 11 by 14 and stuff like that. But whether it's uh, epic characters, like characters that call for epic, like um, Silver Surfer, Thor, the Hulk. Uh, you know the rocketeer you know those guys the aerial aerial guys you know that's the kind of stuff you indulge in uh, but if it was for example if somebody had a fetish for a toad um, <laughs> you know one of those uh, or uh, what was that guy from the avengers the, the not the west coast avenger the great lake avengers like the bouncy guy uh, uh blue and blue and orange bubbles on his costume yeah. so, oh man uh, that i would that i would do on a smaller smaller size you know i'd probably what? do a magneto you know something like that but 
Oh, that's interesting. Well, and I, what I found interesting too about the surfer when you kind of showed it to me last week, um, mm -hmm. you, you brought him to the forefront. Um, cause I, I see a lot of surfer commissions and the, the focus is tends to be on, on what's going on around. Um, whereas, whereas you brought him to the forefront. I was just kind of curious what, what made you decide on that? And I know you kind of explained to me what you were going to do with some of the, once you add colors, but just curious on your, your thought process behind it. Cause I, I think it's fantastic composition and I'm really pumped to see it, but, um, yeah, just curious. Well, on I'm obviously not going to finish it tonight, but, um, <laughs> the idea, the idea is to, I wanted to treat myself with all the um, chrome silvery reflections, especially on the parts where your attention would be, which would be obviously the head and the hand. And um, I want to try, if I can, uh, actually on the, directly on the piece. Speedball, thank you. <laughs> um, I would like to give a sense of depth between the face, the shoulders, and the arms, and the arm and the feet in the back and yeah this... by, by not bringing as much contrast on that uh, right leg as i would on the biceps forearm hand deltoid and, and, and head and, uh, I might uh, be a little loud because i need to blow dry the piece in order to straighten it out a little bit more I apologize for that. No worries. Because it doesn't go fast enough. It never goes fast enough. So to straighten the piece, I'm I'm curious just to straighten the board? To straighten the paper because even if you secure it with tape, which I did, I used uh, blue tape, it gets wobbly because oh, cool. I sprayed water to begin with to make sure that the background color that I would put would uh, somewhat be more evenly uh, applied uh, on, on those white surfaces. Well, that's very interesting. And for anyone who just tuned in, I don't know if we mentioned it earlier, maybe we did it. The surfer is 18 by 24, correct? Yep. Yeah. So it's it's a monster. <laughs> and I also found because I'm not I'm not too fond of super super thin brushes that don't have a lot of um, color in it when it comes to painting details. So what I like to do is I like to work a little bit bigger when I do watercolor pieces so that details like the eyes, some wrinkles on the forehead and stuff like that, I can actually make them uh, very, very fine just because, see, for example, I don't know if you, yeah, okay, here, this kind of brush as is gorged with water and color. Oh, yeah. And the, but at the same time, it's got a super fine tip. So I could be doing the the forehead wrinkles and stuff like that. Oh, cool. All right. I'm about to start. I don't know what you can see, because all I see is the pencils right now. Yeah. Okay, so hold on. It's probably because my phone went sleeping. Ah, uh, so it just. Okay, so it says I'm on the show here, but I don't see anything. Everyone can see. Ah. My microphone is muted on the phone, but should I hit video? Oh, 
Um, sure. Yeah. So it's you're saying that's just frozen on that image? Yeah, it's frozen. I don't know what you guys can see. Um, just the pencils. Yeah, that's weird because I started a. Uh, I started color and uh, it used to work for a little while. For a while at the beginning. Um. I don't know why you don't see. Still the pencil. Yeah. Yep. Still the pencil. Uh, do you want to? Um, do you want to just log back on with uh, the? Sure. Just on on the phone, yeah, the phone, and yeah, see if that kind of reboots it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the other one is on a tablet, so. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start again on this one. Okay. And uh, all right. Yeah, it's that's weird because we we have the odd glitch on here, uh, but it, it's that's a that's a new one, I think. <laughs> Okay, so let me see. Why doesn't it switch? Gods or the gods disapprove of this um, <laughs> session. not coming up because I can see it's, over there the top of my head but it's a frozen image yeah and here and here on my phone it's still uh, spinning um, sorry folks we we even did a test run <laughs> They're dialed in. Yeah, yeah, we did one that's really. But in the meantime, anyone uh, watching, hit us up with some questions and uh, there you give go. us give us some uh, some character requests. Oh, nice! Oh, nice! There you go. There you go. I will. There, that's perfect. Awesome. So, Stefan, we were talking earlier. I know I uh, um, brought it up earlier about uh, cool pieces you'd like to tackle. Um, but before we get into that, let's just talk about um, your 
your your affection for Garth Ennis. I think, like you said, uh, some people associate you with you know really really aesthetically pleasing, gorgeous female pieces, and I think um, just because it's something you excel at. A lot of folks probably don't realize where your your true interests in, in comics uh, kind of lie. So, um, why don't you talk about Garth Ennis and, and Preacher and how that kind of uh, yeah. So uh, let's I, let's not mis let's not be mistaken. My my favorite character is hands down the Rocketeer. Okay. But <laughs> when it comes to stories and. Uh, the skills it takes to tell those stories and the the intensity that are brought into those stories. Uh, Garthinus is one of the like really really on top of of my list. Yeah. One and, and specifically the one that was a major that was a wake up call was was a preacher for sure. I like how he, he tackles um, certain topics and and it's like when he has his teeth into something, he doesn't let go of it until he's uh, given his uh, thoughts on it, on it. And it's 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 really interesting and exciting to see. And maybe it resonates with some of the things I am. Um, I think or I perceive or a certain way. I don't know. Well, that, um, that that's interesting too, because, you know, I talked about that uh, last weekend a little bit. Um, I think it, uh, him sinking his teeth into something and not letting it go. I think that describes him perfectly. Because <laughs> uh, I'm also a huge, huge Ennis fan. Uh, and, you know, the way he tackles topics, even if maybe his viewpoints are a little strong or, or maybe he, he gets a little too heavy handed with with some things, I think. And we talked about it briefly last weekend, too, that um, he's such an incredible storyteller. Even when you peel away all these layers of commentary and all the craziness in his books, at the core of his stories, there's a really really great love story to be told or Western to be told. Yeah. Um, well, the thing is, you said he has strong opinions on things, but, and I know it's a double edged sword because sometimes strong opinions can lead to really nasty and things we don't really, um, old, old, um, monsters and stuff that we don't want to resurface, see resurface in our society. But he's telling stories. It's just fiction, and at the That's same right. time, it is conveying. And at the same time, it is conveying, conveying some truth about who we are as human beings and how low we can be, and how either on some small levels or some bigger levels we can redeem ourselves. Uh, he's not lecturing anybody about this. He's not setting a moral standard or whatever. You take what you want in the stories he has to tell, but showing the lowest mankind can go is not uh, done to bring us down is just to tell him things as they are because uh, not that we think about it on a daily basis but every once in a while whatever your background or your culture is I guess there's always been a, a fascination for what lays underneath what what is the game at play whether it's geopolitically or emotionally between people and we always want to sugarcoat and we live in a society that is trying to make everything look glamorous and sexy and wantable and something we want to have own or become uh, when at the end of the day we wake up and we walk around 
in our pajamas when we get the chance because we don't want to wear pajamas all the time. But uh, the media is trying to sell us everything as the utmost sexiest thing you can own or you can be. And he doesn't buy any in any of that BS. And I, I think it's refreshing. Yeah, I, I think you're bang on. And before we, we get into some more of that, uh, just quickly, Stefan, Jonathan asks, do you like uh, the Preacher TV show? I, you know what? I watched it uh, up to a certain point. And I found myself forcing myself to watch it. I, I know you've had conversations about uh, the art of Steve Dillon, yeah. which I think w was a perfect choice for the book because it steps down in a certain level or focus on aesthetics that would be unnecessary for such a powerful book. Yeah. And at the same time, in the TV show, there are some aspects of the aesthetic that lies into also, and I, I mean, I'm just, I'm maybe too predictable for that, or I might be too, too, too much of a sucker for what a comic book is when it's such, um, it's done in such a brilliance. And when you have, um, a lineup of artists that does such great art, like Glenn Fabry with the colors. Yeah. It was so realistic that I was a little bit disappointed with the cast, not in their ability to act. I think Tulip was, the personality was, was perfect. I love uh, the, the actress, the way she the way she performs and I've seen her in other stuff and I really I really acknowledge the you know the skills and the talent and everything but I think I was too tied on what she actually looks in the comic book and I was expecting to see that that's yeah that's a good point and I mean it's it's all it's all varnish it's all it's only superficial right it doesn't it doesn't do any damage to the show. The things that I had more, um, I struggled more with was that I know the book so well that when they were either taking shortcuts or liberties, I was a little thrown off. It was actually sometimes pulling me out, getting me back in, pulling me out, you know, stuff. Like, and I was, I was like. I was also watching it with an eye, with the eye of a director because I directed animation shows. Yeah, I did a lot of storyboards, yeah. and knowing the the book, I was like, okay, TV shows have the budgets of movies these days. Uh, so it's not about the money, it's not about the format, it's about the decisions you make on how you tell the story. And it was too distracting for me to just enjoy the, the series. Well, I, th I think being such a big fan, you know, and I, I, I was kind of the same way. I watched the first episode and I, I might have watched part of the second, but it, it almost mm -hmm. it, it derailed from, from the book yeah. really early. And I think it's, it skipped some interesting things that I wanted to see in live action. And oh, when they, you know, to me, when they showed God the first time, I was like, uh-uh. <laughs> I was like, no. And Why? It's just because this is, this is not how they built up the whole thing in the book. It was, uh, it came too fast, too early, I think. And I mean, even if you play with the image, I think the thing they did a great job uh, with was the 
the slaughterhouse uh, scenes and everything, everything revolving around that was uh, was really uh, done like like in the book. Oh, and I I, I can't. Didn't, I didn't watch. I didn't watch the whole show, but so I can't say. I can't. I can't tell if uh, they integrated. I don't. I think they didn't because maybe the the estate would have a, a say about this. But um, I like that moment in the book where uh, they do. They 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 have a nod to Elvis. Oh yeah. When Jesse when Jesse is uh, picked up by a guy in a pickup truck, and the way it's told, the way it's written with the accent that you can actually hear, uh, that was just like that was one of the best written uh, sequential art, with really minimal uh, staging and stuff because you never see the the, the guy's head. And you, when you get who it is, you're like, oh my god! <laughs> ah, that was just—that's one of my favorite parts. One, well, and I—I I didn't. One of my. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Stefan. I, I was gonna say just to, to balance that out. My least favorite part is the one with, uh, what's his name, Napoleon, the, the French guy that kills horses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was, uh, <laughs> wow, that was like super cliche of a French man. But I mean, I don't, I don't care. I was like, everything else was pushing the boundaries and in some ways not uh, tapping into cliches that much or just exploding them blowing them away and this one was kind of like an easy way out i was like i don't know and it looked it looked maybe a little bit too uh corny i don't know but that was also on a wasn't that on a uh, spin-off not a spin-off but um an extra issue that was not part of the actual story I'd have to double check, but it, it could have I been. Think uh, yeah, I think it, it was like one of the, it might have been part of the Saint of Killers uh, short uh, mini mini series or something. I haven't, I haven't yeah. read it in a while. Yeah, it was always, I was so enthralled with the, the main storyline. I, I should probably go give those one-offs and those, those mini series a, a better go because I, I read all of Preacher and Trade and I was kind of disappointed every time they had a one-off or you know something thrown in there because I was I just wanted to to keep on the the ride with Annis and Dylan. And, yeah. Um, you know, to um, get back to the show, uh, I was at first when I heard they were making a show, I was actually feeling better about it than when I heard many years before that they were going to do a movie because I was like, there's no way you can cramp all the aspects of the books in a two hour movie. No. So when, so when I heard that they, they, they were, they were considering doing a TV show, I'm like, oh yes, there you go. That's, that's the way to go. Especially because we had all those, new show, well established shows by that time where you knew they could they could actually take their time to to tell good stories like the sopranos or uh, the wire you know where they establish things they take time to do it right i was like okay they're gonna do it right and then they did uh, something that st strays away sometimes and it was it was too um it's too frustrating for me. So I kind of uh, dropped the ball on it. Yeah, I, I, I hear. You. I think stuff. The fact they are taking this, and even if, what well, I think most people have a pretty good review of the Watchmen series too. Um, mm -hmm. 
I, I felt like that's that's a different kind of storytelling. But I just want to go back to your point about. But you know what? It's actually with the, with the Watchmen. It has a weird, and it's a positive thing. You know, weird might not be the the word for it, but it's taking it somewhere else. And yet it is cohesive. It makes sense. It's like an, uh, what we call in French an exercice de style, and an, a practice in style, which would be you get the fundamentals and you play with them. And at the same time, they, they what they did is that they took it from where the movie kind of uh, ended because they tell things differently like Dr. Manhattan is away. He's gone already. Yeah. But they make it something different from the movie and I, 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 got, it. I got into it. I like it. More than what the, the, the team that worked on uh, Preacher did. So it's very subjective. It's it's very subjective. No, I I, I couldn't agree more. I, I wanted to just touch on your point, Stefan, about um, Preacher, the show, and, and Jonathan, you know, brought it up to you, but about how when they show God that early on, it feels like they kind of miss the point in the comic a bit, you know, that there was so much build up and, and all this stuff. And I found, I found with the boys too, another Annis property. One thing that, that bugged me about that was um, I felt like in the comic, whether you like the comic or not, um, Billy Butcher was always such an interesting character. And I feel like when they changed um, his story a little bit, uh, especially right towards the end. Uh, I felt like that really took a lot out of the story for me because in the comic, you're waiting 50 issues to find out what happened to Butcher's wife, what happened to him to make him so spiteful and re revengeful and, and, um, and all these things. And, but, yeah. yeah. And in the, the TV show, you find out, the end of season one <laughs> and yeah, i think part yeah, exactly. of it, trying to make sure you get that second season which i understand but i felt like it just it took so much away because I, I remember reading the boys issue by issue on comiXology of all things every single night just just oh. because i'm like i, I want to find out more about this guy i want to know why he is the way he is and I, I felt like that really cheapened it for me with the show but that's for a new viewer, I'm sure it, it's not um, it's not not that bad. And my my it apology. Also, it also it also probably has to do with the uncertainty of after let's say they might have a good guess that okay we're we're gonna do a season two, but there's so much happening in season two that we might as well fast forward the whole situation with his wife because we're not guaranteed we'll do a season three. And in case we don't, we want to have enough explanations on why the character is the way he is. I don't know. That's just a guess for me. But I know, I know that for um, having worked in production sometimes, and there's so many things you want to put in your show. And you know you, you should hold on to them just to build up the, the interest because you know the character is going to generate interest anyway. You get a great actor for it. He brings so much. But the story can go without it. But that would also deprive you uh, of... Uh, adding uh, substance to the character. Why is he hurting so much? 
why uh, or it could be also redeeming qualities you know for the for the character to be motivated to do what he does yeah so i can see why they probably fast forwarded it uh out of you know let's do it now in case we can't do it later yeah uh but uh the show still works for me except for what we talked about this weekend about uh, how they ruined that song for me but that's uh, that's just a detail well wow, that's what I, I thought about earlier today uh before we went on about that final song and stefan maybe we'll get you to touch on that here in a second i just want to get to dan's comment about um he just says he still has to watch the final season of preacher but he thought it was well done as comic book readers we have a built-in bias towards the source material of course um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and then that's that's what yeah, it's, it's so hard for us to just enjoy something as it is because of those expectations. And not just the expectations, you know, the Watchmen, Preacher, the boys, like well, maybe less so the boys, but Preacher and, and Watchmen are, are incredibly well done stories in, in any medium. Like it doesn't, it's not just because know, it's a comic. It's, you know, it's, it's a masterful there's Sorry. something there's so much work there's so much work put in it and i'm not even talking about the the artistic part the writing to make it cohesive balanced in terms of pace of moments where you would slow down things to establish a little bit background or the moments where you would rush things to give the reader a sense of urgency, danger, excitement. And, and at the same time, you do rush parts because you either suspect a flaw that you know you can't address, although that's not the way to go. You, you, you might want to settle the record, you know, and make sure that everything is airtight as much as possible. Yeah. Um, uh, and sometimes you just go over some things because you as a writer you know they are not relevant to the story or to the understanding or empathy you would get for for a character or the disgust that you want to generate uh, from the reader about the character so you juggle with all these things and then i know we keep talking about the fact that once you've done your your, you've pr produced your your opus you it happens that people take it from there and make it their own and stuff like that but there's something with all the effort that the writer has put in the reader brings something else which is equally committing to the book and when that happens it means the writer has done his job He's done a good job. Yeah. Where the emotions you wanted to convey, like the love story between Tulip and uh, Jesse, the betrayal of Cassidy, the, all those things, the way they take a certain pace to be built up in the book. If this is rushed as a job in a show or in a movie, you can feel betrayed by that. And in a way, it is legitimate because this is what helped build the personality of the characters. The way you perceived as a reader a sense of re realism to what was happening in a situation that is completely like she's a killer, he's a vampire, she gets her hooked on drugs. And, okay, but it resonates with things that seem so real for the reader the reader brings his part of uh, believability to all the efforts that the writer has done yeah that when somebody brings his own subjectivity because he has interpreted it as different than hundreds of readers have understood otherwise the same way and then somebody who has access to producing, directing, you know, putting it in another medium, imposes his vision or, or proposes his vision is more, is more 
manufacturer. Uh, it can be it can be sometimes disappointing. Um, it's interesting because the I think when I was reading uh, Preacher for the first time, I did have expectations about where comics go, and you want the hero to win, you want him to get the girl. And when I think that was one of the most jarring things I've ever read in a comic book was when Cassidy got Tulip hooked on drugs because mm -hmm. it, that whole sequence made me so uncomfortable and I didn't like it. <laughs> you know, it, well, it truly. And the, thing, and the thing also is that despite we, we lost track for, um, I don't want to say for a split second, but that's where he's tricky and he's talented, a talented bastard. <laughs> yeah, because he tricked us into liking Cassidy and Cassidy is a guy that has lived centuries and doesn't care and we kind of lost track of that because he was on a weird perverted way he was lovable and yeah. we tend to forget that dude he's a vampire <laughs> and that is the kind of is trickery a word? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. Okay. So it's the kind of stuff that we fell for, all of us, or most of us as readers. And and when he did that, we we're like, oh, no, dude, dude, no. I, I know I was like that. I was not, I was, I was somehow uncomfortable with it, but I was like, dude, you don't do that. Because I, I saw it as a metaphor of something else. Like yeah. the dirty traits that a friend would do to a friend through his girlfriend, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, you don't do that. You don't do that. And um, that's how it, it resonated with me. But I was like, damn, he tricked us. <laughs> what? And it, it's funny, too, because I think part of the trickery with, with Ennis is Jesse is such a black and white character in some regards that yeah. right is right and wrong is wrong like he, he's 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 driven by this moral compass and obviously you know he crosses some lines and lots of other stuff goes on but you know at the end of the day you know it's this this respect it's this wild west old school respect thing that, that jesse has and for someone to stab him in the back that's like another, that. that's another that's another perversion of the story i don't know I haven't read any interviews or, or anything that Garth Ennis might have said about this. But after the, the John Wayne era of cowboys and stuff, it has actually on a European or maybe on a, on a wider worldwide scale, I think in like in the Middle East, in maybe in parts of, I don't know, India, uh, South America, definitely in France and Europe, in some kind of parts of Europe, it's, it seems like there has been a rejection of the, of the symbol of the American cowboy that knew right from wrong yeah and so i i would have to read again preacher because i haven't done that in, in a long time but i remember thinking when jesse's references to john wayne you know walk the walk and talk the talk uh i don't recall later on in the book any questioning of what is what is the truth what is right yeah what is right and what is wrong which could have been something that i guess jesse gets shaken in what he believes in the beginning and what he was taught to believe as a kid of course but then he switches from that to the john wayne gospel you know? <laughs> and and he could have questioned that and say okay is that Am I falling for something else without seeing that I'm actually recreating the same uh, the same pattern? Yeah. 
And it, it's it's kind of tricky because the cowboy uh, moral compass really had been shaken after uh, a few decades of Western movies and stuff, and people got fed up with that, and they got they wanted something else. They wanted greer characters. They wanted. Um, it's it's interesting that in the seventies you had a whole series of movies that were very. Um, they would seem negative. They would seem like uh, pessimistic. And in a way they were. But if you look at The Omega Man, Planet of the Apes, um, Bullet, Serpico, Brubaker, all those movies, they, were, they had a sense of realism that... Um, that was tarnishing the image of the hero, even Dirty Harry. Yeah. It was tarnishing the, the image of the, the, the righteous cowboy that John, John Wayne established. And uh, after a while, people got, got fed up with, with, with that icon. So it kind of fell through. Yeah. And, and for Jesse to, to hold on to that because of his upbringing, obviously, that makes sense. But he could have been questioning it more, you know. Uh, down the line, it would have made. I, I'm pretty sure it would have made for interesting, um, uh, different decisions made in some uh, in some instances. Of course, we like when he orders that guy to count a grain of sand on the beach. So it's <laughs> our little sadistic pleasure, and you know he's in charge and he makes the rules and stuff. But um, on a more uh, profound and subtle level, it would have been interesting to see him question the righteousness of the things that he was um, subscribing to. Yeah. That he choose, well, choose to embrace. What's funny with Ennis, too, I think that's part of his genius, is... You know, he's presenting these things. And, and like you said before, he's not necessarily enforcing an opinion on you because even that that really that moral compass of this the american cowboy and this this black and white sense of right and wrong he, you know he he's pretty well known to hate superheroes and hate hate them at their core values and their core concepts because they just yeah. don't that don't work in the real world but and and that moral compass that that right and wrong you know, it's, it's not that different from the American cowboy, you know, the, the American superhero. It's a lot the same. It's, a good, it's at the same time, it's okay if um, superheroes don't work in the real world because they're just modern transposition of the myth of the hero from ancient Greece. That's what it is. Yeah. If you take it for just what it is, it shouldn't prevent you from telling those stories if that's your angling. But but the thing is, uh, you know, I think also I I, I don't want to speak for Garthinas, but I think if you if you are upset with the things that he might or might not be trying to enforce, I think he doesn't give a damn. Yeah. And that's and that's the best way to approach. Nobody puts a gun on your face, on your head, and say, "Read my book." If you don't want to read that's it. Right. You don't read it. You know. Well, I, I think that was something that was uh, um, cosmetically really disappointed with with the show was Arceus. <laughs> uh, the fact that they try to keep him like a cute, you know. No, 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 guys. No, go the whole mile. Go the whole mile for Christ's sake. Yeah, you know, people are puking when they see his face. Like in the comic. Yeah. It's but 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 they try to they try I mean he he still he he missed his suicide and yet he's still putting a lot of work in having the right hair to do. It's like it's it's weird. 
Well, that was one of my favorite things in the comics is when Arse Face was singing and trying to figure out what he was singing um, yeah. based on, on the mumbles. Because, you know, eventually you can kind of figure it out if you if you caught on early, but I always enjoyed doing that. Um, just uh, Dan asked another question here, or just spoke on um, um, uh, Sandman. He says... I, can't tell you how excited I am about a game and led Sandman show on Netflix, but it's guaranteed to have differences and new nuances that won't jive with the comic book. He says that there's, there's a lock, um, that it's a lock based on the casting search news that's out there right now. I was curious what you thought about that, Stefan. Do you have any affection for game and, and, and Sandman? I have never, unfortunately, I've never read any of the books and I know it's a big, um, it's it's missing in my understanding of the genius genius of Neil Gaiman. So, and I would hate to discover the show before I I've immersed myself into uh, into his story. So, I might I might grab a trade paperback of some of the arcs that he uh, that are significant. Uh, but maybe Stefan, maybe this is a chance for you to go in blind. And not, you know, ruin a good production because of um, your yeah. your expectations based on the comic. Yeah, but the, you know, all those things, all those things that I I got a little upset uh, with was because also when I read Preacher, I was way uh, I it was it was twenty years ago. I was really uh, I was less. It made a strong impression. It made a strong That's impression that whatever I read these days, I can, I can, um, how do you say? I can take, I can take it with a grain of salt. I can, um, I can put things in perspective. Right. Yeah. The things I read when I was 20, 25, I was still I was still an avid reader of comic books, and I was kind of like um, not finding the the things I wanted to read in the mainstream books at the time, except for very very few exceptions, uh, like uh, some of Alex Ross's books, like Kingdom Come, Marvels, uh, uh, and before that, you know, Frank Miller, like uh, the Daredevil run. Uh, um, uh, the um, the Watchmen, Batman Year One, uh, and stuff. I'm mixing more with with Miller, but that's when I read all those books around the same time. That's what got me back into comic book. But then after that, I I needed something with substance, and that's when uh, books like Preacher came out. Yeah, and that was my next step, and that was the, and that that's like the last thing I read that really really knocked me off my my seat. Um, and and also, you know, after that, I was so busy with my career in animation, I didn't have much time to go to the comic book store to read books. And then after that, being in the comic book industry. I had even less time to read, so I missed on a lot of uh, really good books that I know are good. I just don't have the time to um, to read them. Well, it's funny that you say that because I was talking. I've talked to a couple creators, just at cons, um, and this was this was years ago when I first started collecting. And I, I know David Finch was one of them, and um, I can't recall who the other one was, but just talking to them about this is the same kind of thing where, um, Hey, what are you reading? What do you like? And, and David and another guy both said, um, I, I don't read anything. And, and they both made a point to say, it's not me trying to be pretentious. I love comics. Yeah, no. I just oh, yeah, yeah. don't have time. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, and, and it's like when you have time for yourself, and you don't want to. You don't want to do painting. You don't want to do sculpting. You 
you've you've played with your kids, you've done you know spent some time with your friends and stuff. When you have time for yourself, the things that you might want to think you might you might think you want to catch up with is reading an actual book. Uh, uh, more than uh, reading more comic books. It's, you know, it's that joke where, no, it would remind me of work. And in a way, there's some truth to that, you know. You, and, and you, wouldn't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't help keeping the professional line and say, oh, I would have done that different. Or it's hard to pull yourself out and, and be, uh, just let yourself, you know, be carried away uh, with the story. You can't do that uh, with all the books. Obviously, preacher. I was not uh, looking at the book and dissecting it. And again, in a way, Steve Dillon's art helped with that because it is established uh, as the the style is going to make it so that you will focus on a level of the writing like you haven't before. That's right. Um, At first, and I don't know. When, my, when my friend introduced me to Preacher, I was already a lot into the beauty of the line art of a comic book. And I was like, uh uh, that's not for me. And then my friend insisted, and he said, no, no, seriously, do read it. And I trust his judgment. So when, uh, when you know, when he speaks, you listen. And, um, and I was like, oh, dude, you are so right. You are so right. Yes. I don't know if he... <laughs> Uncle Sherwood. I don't know who that is for. Yeah, this... It's it's a giveaway. Whoever is the best comment at the end of the show gets it, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting you say that. And I, I just wanted to bring up because um, the Watchmen with Dave Gibbons, and I don't know if, if you would agree with this or not, but I kind of felt it was probably a lot the same. Whereas I think Dave Gibbons and Steve Dillon are both fantastic artists, but um, yeah. they're the, the type of artists that can really let the story play out. Um, you, know. you know, I think it, it might also be something, I don't know how it played out, who made the decision or who made the suggestion. But if the editor had a part to play in it, kudos to him, because that is exactly the way to play it. Unsuspecting. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of like they're trying to tell you, okay, we're putting a solid artist behind it. But don't focus too much on the art. The art is an important part. And I'm an artist. I'm telling you from an artist's perspective. And um, it's not, it's the vessel, but what is important is the cargo. And yeah, if the, if the editors had a say on this or on Watchmen, that is, that is a brilliant move because the art sometimes has to step down. It can woo you because you would miss, you would miss, um, the sub layers, you know, uh, on 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 the stories and the intricacies of the of the story. I think, for example, the what was it called after Watchmen? The miniseries they did after. Yeah, yeah, after Watchmen or before Watchmen. I, I, uh, there's some brilliance in the episodes drawn by Adam Hughes, story-wise. But I'm stunned, I'm, I'm in awe in front of the art. And in a way, in a way, because of his uh, great staging skills and layout skills too, you get the story, you get the, the subtext of the image, of what he brings in the image. But I get way 
too distracted by the awesomeness of the art. What's know, it? It's like, it's, it's, um, <laughs> it's, yeah, I was, I was reading it uh, last week and I was like, oh, at the middle, I had to stop. I'm like, ah, oh, Steph, you're getting sucked in. <clears throat> you're getting sucked in the art again. <laughs> paying attention to what's uh, what's in the tech in the balloons you're just uh, being blown away by how awesome he can uh, draw and and uh, how this is done and the colors and uh, look what shortcut he took here and yet it's still still better than what all of us artists combined will ever do <laughs> and, uh, yeah i got i got distracted by that i'm like oh man focus dude focus which um, mini did Adam do? I can't remember. Um, which character was it based? It was Dr. Folks. Manhattan. Dr. Manhattan. Ah, uh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it's the one where he he plays with, uh, in his layouts, he plays with um, the cogs of a clock and stuff. See, that's how much I remember the story. It's I remember seeing cogs of a clock and, and, and a cat in a box. Rodinger's cat, cat that's dead or or alive or both, or, and uh, yeah, Schro Schro Schrodinger's Schrodinger's cat. But the only one in the box is not quite dead. If you if you want to believe he's alive, he's alive. Um, yeah, I, it's funny you bring up those mini series too because I I often find that because. Um, for whatever reason, I really enjoy Amanda Connor's work, and yeah. um, I and, and she did the Silk Sex, Silk Spectre uh, mini on there, and um, with her stuff she too. I Phil, she did the Phil Spectre. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, with the wig and everything. Yeah, yeah, and she. Um, I find that with most of her books too, is I, I do just enjoy what she's, she's drawing so much that I, I am not paying attention to the intricacies, intricacies of the story, like you mentioned. <laughs> and Dan brings up the pro. I do love the pro. <laughs> the intricacy of the, of the plot in the pro is, is mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, uh, yeah, they're they're an odd mix for sure. She's got yeah. She uh, Amanda is number one. She's a peach. She's a sweetheart. And number two, it's it constantly has that fresh, like refreshing, refreshing uh, uh, take on any character. As I just yeah. I'm biased. I worked with those guys, and they're like, uh, along with uh, Paul Dini, they're like one of the best uh, experiences I've had so far. Oh, that's that's good to hear. Um, just going back to Jonathan's question earlier, Safan. Um, yeah. We and we we touched on it earlier. You probably haven't read Silver Surfer Black, have you? That's one of the newer. No surfer no. series. And Jonathan, I, I, it was really enjoyable. I think, I think all red slot. I, I think that's kind of the preeminent one for me. Anyways, the the newer one. Um, the tr the trad book was was gorgeous and really cool. But, um, yeah, it, uh, it it's lucky we're getting to see some some cool cosmic stuff. And some more, you know, creator-driven uh, stories in the big two, taking some some risks that they maybe didn't take before. Um, I would but. love to see. Uh, maybe it has been done. I don't know. Like I said, I, I don't read too many, uh, but I would love to see a graphic novel like format, like something where they actually let him, you know do something and he takes his time to do it right. Uh, Gabriella Deloro doing a, a Silver Surfer graphic novel. That would just knock it out, uh, out of the park. When, when they gave him that 
brief X Force miniseries, Sex and Violence. I thought it was the same way. I really enjoyed, uh, um, really enjoyed that. It was just him running wild and excuses to draw Wolverine and Domino and all these action and and sexy poses. Uh, I love that book. But he's so good uh, with um, light, light shining out of the darkness that I can't. I can't imagine if he were, if you were to do a, uh, even just maybe a one shot, like something with a, a light story, I, I want to say, with a silver surfer, but it's, it's just him against the vastness of space. And it wouldn't even need to be as colorful and and sexy and glamorous as you know the ba the space backgrounds you have in Guardians of the Galaxy the movies, like with all the colors of the rainbow and stuff like that. But something where it's pitch black and just the surfer coming out of uh, that void and shining and being like a, a beacon of uh, hope or whatever alien race that he comes to to the rescue, you know, or, or to help you know, out and stuff. That would be, uh, it would just be gorgeous. It would just... Ryan, Ryan asks, um, who would you want to see write a surfer book? Or who, who could write a good surfer book in, in your opinion, Safan? Wow. Wow, wow. Depends on what you want to do. Depends on what kind of story you want to tell. If you want to go back to some sort of established roots, like the Silver Surfer is kind of like a Jesus creature, you know, in, in intergalactic space and stuff. I would, I would have maybe a team up with. Uh, somebody somebody developing the story and, and writing the story with alex ross um, but potentially comic book artists who do mainstream um oh i would have to check that one the assad rivet uh surfer mini series um there's a bunch of guys that I like. I like their writing. I like Jim Kruger's writing. Um, uh, and potentially, you know, <laughs> that's really makes sense. Come some mainstream mainstream writers have their own projects too that they write and they do an equally good job at that, if not better sometimes. But um, uh, Potentially, every mainstream writer should be able to switch from Iron Man to Silver Surfer. To some people are are more comfortable with writing group stories, like you know, uh, like uh, Fantastic Four uh, and stuff, and they're not as not as inspired by you know loners or or or, or single characters and stuff. So I don't know. Well, I think I like the way I like the way Matt Fraction writes stories. I like, um, yeah, Jim Kruger. Yeah. Well, I think the first step in in trying to, especially with some of these big two characters, and if you get get a writer you want on it, having that you know Elseworlds, that out of continuity mini that they could write, I think is is half the battle because. Oh, you know, yeah. you know, yeah, the giving a fresh take to a character that's established is also creatively very interesting to do. You know, because so, you, you feel less um, you feel less guilty taking the character in different paths and and taking chances with the characters because it's 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 a it's a it's a sandbox that is established as being. It's an alternate reality. You have fun with that. So I guess it's, I guess it's it's uh, it's it's liberating in some ways. 
I'm 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 excited to see what uh, the what if uh, Marvel uh, series is going to be about. The animated, yeah, that... uh, is it going to be animated? I think it's animated, right? It's animated. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm excited to see what, what what's going to come out of that. Face McRuffbeard says, who could use a fresh start in Marvel Universe? And I, I'm not sure if that's just uh, Uncle Sherwood. <laughs> that's a different, uh, that's a different uh, moniker, but. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta make sure he's not playing with your own perception. Um, what was the question? What, who could use a fresh start character wise? Like a reboot or something. Yeah, even just a reboot, a rebrand, <gasps> anything like that. I don't know. It would have to be an obscure character. Because whoever came back and got his own miniseries or got reintroduced and, or just, you know, I mean, the, the the popularity a character like a squirrel girl acquired you know over the years and stuff like that you're like at first you might want to think what the heck and then you go if it's written in a in a fun way in an endearing way and it's 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 entertaining and stuff why not you know at first i remember when um long time ago when um for a while, the Fantastic Four were, it was the Hulk, Wolverine, Spider-Man, and uh, Ghost Rider. I was like, what the heck? I, I guess I was conservative in my in my perception of what, what, the, what the, the brands about superheroes and characters should be. But when it's written... Uh, in an entertaining way, fun, and you got to take it for what it is. The, the, the actual family is going to come back anyway. Nobody really dies uh, in comic books. So eventually they're going to come back and be the family you know and love. And stuff. <laughs> but at first I was really, I was really upset. I'm like, no, no, so like Spider-Man. And, and sometimes it gets me, you know, like, okay, Spider-Man's been an Avenger. He's been a he's been a Fantastic Four. Uh, what else hasn't he been yet? A Defender, an Invader, <laughs> you know, a Guardian of the Galaxy. Uh, so, once they've run out of all those things, what are they going to do? Well, I like the idea of because you only see it a little bit with Venom. Um, I like taking some of these '90s characters that were very much yeah. of their time, you know, yeah. that '90s attitude, crazy yeah. rendered, you know, uh -huh. and and kind of and bringing that was the in. perfect example. Yeah. And uh, I guess I haven't read enough of the, the new Stagman Kate's Venom, but you know, by all all reviews and accounts, people people really like it. Um, yeah, to just kind of apply that that those '90s attitude sensibilities to a more modern time and in a few different directions. I think there there's a whole whole flack of characters there. Vic says hi, salut, Stefan. Victor hey, Don, salut. Uh, yeah, I, I I kind of that's kind of like when I dropped the. The nineties is when I dropped the ball on those edgy uh, characters like yeah, like Venom and then and then Carnage and then you know Scarlet Spider and all that stuff. You know. And I was going back to the basics with with the um, the DC characters. And at the time, I was more into Kingdom Come or Justice League. The Justice League that. Um, was it Keith Giffen, I think? It was like the comedic era with, um, what's his name? Kevin McGuire drawing the, 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 
um, the Justice League. It was uh, with Guy Gardner as the Green Lantern for uh, the Justice League, and then Adam News did a few did a few issues. I was reading those because they were funny, and I was reading when I wanted serious stories. I was leaning towards Marvels. And, and then after that, Kingdom Come and stuff like that. And I was going back to the basics, uh, Year One, uh, uh, Watchmen and stuff like that. So everything that was so 90s, I never got into. Well, I think, you know, so much of that stuff just hasn't really aged well. <laughs> uh, yeah, and I mean, I'm surprised, I mean, I shouldn't say I'm surprised with the success of Venom because Venom taps into the raw energy that, that I guess, younger readers, it's an outlet. It's like, oh, yeah, you don't hold back. You just, you just go crazy. And this is the, the impersonation of, you know, no boundaries, no limits and stuff. When the character is starting to become... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? The establishment. Then probably have to come up with a new character like that. You know, a new character that has that shows uh, the edginess that uh, that uh, Venom had when he was uh, when he was still a young character. Yeah. That's, so that's... What I'm... Oh, okay, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just I was gonna just gonna get back to the piece where what I'm doing right now is uh, what I'm doing with the silver surfer is I'm locking because of the nature of the character all the strong contrast between light and reflection and shadows but in a way when I do especially with watercolor when I do painting i pretty much lean towards the technique that alex ross applies which is you block it's it's the equivalent to the the underpainting technique of uh, for watercolor you just block the shadows and because you block the shadows on the character you bring up the lights and then after that whatever color you're going to put on top if it's a if it's a if it's a warm-blooded character with flesh tones and stuff like that, or even a green alien like Drax, or basically the color that defines the character is not the most important part because the the heavy lifting and most of the work you've done has been done with uh, defining the shadows and the light, and therefore the light. It's almost like a putting colors over the shade, the sh shadow work, the shadow work on a character is like being a five-year-old and, and coloring by numbers. You can't go wrong when you put the, when you put the skin tones or the hair color, as long as you have been, you've done a good job at uh, blocking the lights and the shadows on initially before you put the, the actual color of the object. <laughs> No, oh, that's and that's very interesting. It's more it's more obvious with a surfer because that's all it is. And then what I'll do is, I might go for how the background interacts in terms of colors with him. You know, is right? It me? Is it me or is it the fact that the image is uh, tilted? It was. Um... I think your your phone just flipped it. Um, oh, interesting. Because it was, yeah. It, so it, should it, I should I do this? Sure. Is it better? Is it gonna? You'll probably do that, and then it'll flip it. <laughs> um, it. It doesn't. It doesn't show as much. But uh, okay. There you go. All right. So on, I can see on the screen that everything is pretty much even in terms of darkness. What I'm going to do is I'm going to keep this 
as it is, and I'm going to boost later on, not, not tonight, but I'm going to boost the contrast on that whole area so that it's even darker where it should be. So yep. that I would, it, would, it would look like this is coming more forward and this is more in the distance. And then I'll have to be very cautious with the surfboard that I don't over-render uh, with silver shiny effects the board so it doesn't come forward and crush the character in the, in the attempt of uh, the foreshortening and stuff. And, and for this one, Stefan, you went straight pencils to, to watercolors, right? Yeah, I, I, I wasn't sure at first if I was going to go for a mix of techniques like uh, Micron ink, ink pens, uh, a little bit of pastel, a little bit of uh, pencil, color pencil. I might still do color pencil at the very end to straighten out a few uh, a few details. At uh, uh, and um, and maybe some highlights, uh, not highlights, but blocking of colors with gouache. But I don't know. I don't know. I like I like the uncertainty of I'm gonna play by ear and see where the piece gets me uh, because whenever I try to go for something really established, that's when my I have, I have uh, such expectations that if only one little detail goes wrong, that's the only thing I'll see. When I know I can enhance a few parts with a different technique like put a put a, a layer of oxygen with a white pencil if i want to tone down this part here or if i want to do highlights with white white out or a gouache or acrylic to make something shine or if i want to do a splatter of uh, with, a, with a toothbrush as if it was a super shiny spot on the on the body, then I can still do that and mix it. I like I like when I mix uh, techniques. Yeah, well, that's you know, that's a very very cool, um, interesting approach, for sure. Well, I guess and just remaining fluid as you go is is pretty awesome. Yeah, it's 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 very organic, and I like I like that. I like that it's. Uh, There's a, a part of it that is the image I have in my mind, my head. And there's a part that, I guess it's the happy accidents. And you know, you didn't, you didn't expect uh, that part to turn that way, but then you know that from there you can bring it somewhere else. And you're never really taking chances you're not screwing it up. I mean, you can, people are like, oh my God, uh, watercolor is so difficult and you can't mess it up. You can't erase. Yes, you can. Your eraser is called water. <laughs> you know? that's, a, that's a good point. How much did you play with the composition of this one before you you decided to go. Oh, I did a lot. I did a. Lot. I usually don't uh, do a lot of uh, different compositions. Uh, they're actually here at hand. Let me see. Let them right here. And uh, I remember the 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 first sketch we did when we talked about it. And uh, I recreated it when I got back home. And I actually have them here. I'm putting them on the table. Oh, nice. And I did several, uh, I did several of them, which I usually don't. I usually don't do. And I discarded them because they were, for example, this is this kind of like the same one as, as this one, only on a different angle. Yeah. Um, I think this one was making too big of a part for the, the abdomen here, and that was not the part I wanted to focus on. 
because it would have been it would have been weird. This one is the one that I call my Mobius uh, emulation because there's a for some reason I'm pretty sure it's not in the book, but there is something that like what we talked about in the very beginning of the session, there were a lot of uh, views where the surfer was like profile or three quarter or, or it was very eye level. Like, you know, it was very, uh, a lot of, at eye level. And it was kind of like um, disappointing, like uh, plain. So I discarded this one because it was a little too, you know, straightforward and this one was too close to the um, I think it's a Jumbo Sima cover that uh, was redone by Joe Jasko as a painting a brilliant painting so I didn't want to I didn't want to compare to those guys and miserably fail so, so I went for I went for another approach see I even pushed it to another because I was like okay you can't screw up on that one so force yourself into doing more details go the whole mile and do something that you're you're going to discard afterwards and, and redraw completely on another. I usually don't go as thorough for layout and stuff and then I was like yeah you know what no it's too close too close too close. so I just uh, just put it on the side. And then I went for this one. And this one, I was like, ah, to Galoto. So I just dropped the ball pretty early. Oh, wow. And, was... um, and there, there's something on the video that I did uh, earlier today. Uh, it's, it's really quick on the video. But there's actually this part here. I can't move it too much. But I redid the hand. Because at first it was like this. It was more like a, it was more like a, a hand. I was in that position, like a very, you know, um, John Bosima or uh, another guy that was really good with drawing hands back in the '80s was Kerry Gamel. He had a way of drawing like those really those comic book hands that were like where they at, and that was a little too much. It was dragging too 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 much attention, so I kind of. Did this one, which is uh, in a way it gives a sense of the character almost swimming in space, you know, like carving his way through the void of space. If I want it to be um, a little bit overly dramatic, so he's like it's kind of like he's swimming. But it, it almost and almost like he's, he's balancing himself too on the board, which is true. Yeah, weird. it is. It is a surfer's um, stance or way of standing that you're you're trying to balance yourself. Although you don't need to do that in space. But <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, although if he was to do that, he was he would probably be hunching instead of spreading you know his shoulders and, and 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 exposing his torso he would probably flex his legs and hunch as if he was in the tube ryan asks how about <laughs> those uh, uh, it's a he at 3 a.m in the dark with last cold depressing army. yeah so those initial layouts you showed us i know you did some at fan expo when we were Mm -hmm. engaging in some tomfoolery do you still have those were those the initial ones or is that those are long uh, i'm not sure no i think the ones i did were really really rough and i don't think i kept them but 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 this page is my attempt to recreate what we were talking about these two for sure Okay. Yeah, I kind of forgotten that there was the the uh, inception of this commission occurred uh, late at night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's where it all began with uh, yeah. with with a glass of bourbon in uh, in the library bar. Oh yeah, that was actually 
uh, before. When oh, we right up in the, the yeah, yeah, in the in the room, yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah, for anyone. Yeah, because when, 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 when we were at the bar, when we were at the bar, uh, I did. Uh, I was working on the Green Lantern. Yeah, which was very cool to watch because at first yeah, I I saw you bring your your tools down. I just thought you were washing your brushes or something. Then all of a sudden you just, you know, just side eye glancing. And then I'm like, oh, he's working on something. And then <laughs> sure enough. It's, it's one of those few times when you feel you can, you know, it's always hard to, when you go to a show, you want to spend time with friends, you know, new made friends or, or old ones that you meet again with and, you want to enjoy the company and you know you have some commissions to do you have some work to do uh, so you're torn between uh should i stay a little bit longer downstairs and then go back to my room and do the do the work and this time i i felt like i had the the focus the energy to do that and uh and i would still i knew i would still i was still gonna enjoy the company and somehow uh, um, participate because I knew I had there was some like um, there were some heavyweights of uh, humor among us that night so I just had to listen to all the all the nonsense that was being uh, displayed and said and that was that was hilarious that was funny it was just I was just I was a, I was a I was a spectator and I was having a blast. <laughs> well, and, and not just star studded humor, star studded uh, comics industry with yourself and Gerardo and uh, Scott Williams, yeah. too. Oh, man. It was a yeah, great yeah, night. Yeah, no, that, was, that was a great time. And Dude. that's when I uh, discovered uh, uh, Gerardo, and I was just. When, when, I, when I started watching. Uh, your videos like two weeks ago when he did that um uh lobo and oh yeah so the conan that he had the barbarian that he had done before oh man it's just and he said oh yeah i don't i don't paint too much i i don't do that too often dude like you could have fooled me <laughs> <laughs> that is that was just that's that's brilliant yeah, it's safe to say the paint experiment with Gerardo is uh, a little beyond just an experiment now. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm what, what I'm doing right now, uh, I'm, I'm kind of walking on eggs. Like, I don't want to, um, I don't want to damage the character in terms of, you know, splattering and stuff. I want to establish the shapes, the volumes, the contrast between the different uh, parts. But in the end, to gain some um, energy, regain a little bit more energy on the character, I'm going to add some, there's going to be some mishaps of projections of white paint of uh, speed lines and stuff like that. I want to I want to mess up the, the piece, but that's going to come at the end, either uh, during another session or maybe uh, later on uh, during the weekend, probably, because uh, I'm, I'm working on a couple of things right now that are taking uh, a lot of my time during the day and night. And that is my my first break in a while in a long while usually at that time i'm still uh, still working uh, yeah it, uh, well, it, <laughs> well and we'll gladly uh have you on a, another session to to watch oh, yeah, it's always fun. and i love i love listening to what you like i said before the the way the artists you have on board have uh profound uh, understanding of their medium of the struggles they go through and, and benefiting from their experience their take on uh, on the the industry or the mediums they're using or 
stuff like that is is really uh, is really interesting. I love I love just um, you know connecting and then and then listening to what they have to say. Yeah, see the results happening live. That's just uh, it's been uh, it's it's been great, and I I think. You know, with with yourself, with Evan, with Troy, with Gerardo, you guys coming on, and you guys are open books, and I think we all really appreciate that. Um, it's just uh, get to have a really candid conversation with you guys, and, and really get some insight because I think you know, and you and I talked about it quite a bit too. Just our, our mutual love for Garth Ennis. We talked about it this show, and I think mm -hmm. it's something um, that I would have wouldn't have known um and so now yeah, I know. it's 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 uh i guess i'm no different than a lot of artists that i've known for uh, some very iconic work they've done and then you you meet them at a at a convention or or in in a venue that is not you know the that is not work and you get to talk with them a little bit more about you know what what's their um, other interest in life and you find sometimes the most surprising um, uh, common ground you know like whether what? it's uh, growing growing zucchinis or or watching a uh, british british comedy shows or i remember or... a very uh, surprising conversation one time it was a couple of years ago three years ago maybe Maybe more. It, it flies so fast. I was at a dinner with Louise Simonson and Walt Simonson. And I found out that they were, back when the show aired in the 70s, 80s, they were having sessions with neighbors or friends where they would watch a British show called I, Claudius, about <laughs> the end of the Roman Empire. Uh, starring Derek Jacobi and um, Brian Blessed, who plays the king of the, the flying guys in uh, Flash Gordon. Big, big, fat, bearded guy. Exuberant. How he plays, he plays the king of uh, Naboo, of the Naboo. Uh, not the Naboo, the Jar Jar Binks no. uh, type. It's the guy that goes like this. Uh, he's also in Black Hatter, uh, British comedy show. So that show is a is an amazing. It's Dallas in ancient Rome, and uh, oh wow! And he they told us that they were gathering on. I think it was Friday nights you know, here in the U.S. And they were gathering in front of the TV and avidly watching the show. And uh, and I was like, oh really? That's one of my favorite favorite shows. There's that actress. Can't pronounce her name. I think she's Irish. I'm not sure. She plays one of the priestess in the Dune, uh, David Lynch Dune movie. The one that has like, it seems like she's balding, like the very skinny, scary witch uh, that Paul Atreides actually challenges when he when he puts his hand in the box in the test for those who have seen the movie. And uh, she's a great actress, and she is the wife of Emperor. Augustus Caesar. She's the grandma of uh, Caligula, Claudius, uh, mother of um, Tiberius, and she poisoned an insane amount of her family members, even her husband. <laughs> and she just plays the role to a perfection. And it's just, it's it's pervert, and it's, it's like, ah, uh, you like to see those people you know, stab each other stab each other in the back and it's just it's and it's a really great british uh, show it's all shot in studio it has that that feel that only the british shows of that era have like the doctor who kind of like you know yeah in in on set uh, staging and lighting and stuff and no oh, um i can is it John Hurt? Or John Hurt, yeah. the guy who played the um, in the Alien movie, 
the, with the with the with the alien that burst. I I always yeah. mistook John John and William. Uh, he wasn't there too. He plays uh, Caligula. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, there's a bunch of... Oh, and Patrick Stewart is in this show. Oh, wow. Uh, with with curly hair. <laughs> you don't see Patrick Stewart with curly hair. He plays Sigenus. Uh, he's, uh, he's a general of the Roman mm -hmm. army, and he, he craves power. And yeah, he's got like super, super curly hair, like Shirley Temple. We're talking Shirley Temple uh, curly hair. Yeah, yeah. It's a mini series, um, and it's it's amazing. Oh, well, it's interesting. Yeah, uh, Walt and Simmons Louise and loved it. Louise Simonson were were glued to the TV set to watch that show. Like, oh, cross generational stuff. Well, it's interesting too because you know those two are so so legendary in comics oh, and the yeah. game, and yeah, just, just to know. To, to know a little bit about what makes them tick or what gets them excited is is very cool. Yeah, the the interest they had that was you know that was something else. You never know. You you never know until you get to talk with people. Like sometimes it's a word you'll drop and it will trigger something with one of your you know one of your idols and, and you like oh I never suspected I never knew. Yeah, that, uh, oh, that's right. very good. Well, Stefan, that um, we're, we're coming up on the two-hour mark, so I think now is as good a time as any to maybe shut it down. Um, sure. Let's maybe take one last peek at the surfer. Um, I don't. Let me see if I can. Let me see if I can stretch my. There you go. So people would have a better, better view. Straighten them out. And. Sorry, guys. This is like French engineering. <laughs> no, that's great. I think it, it, it looks fantastic. And, you, you know, once, you know, whenever you finish it, we'll, we'll show it off um, on the live stream. Oh, yeah, I'll make, sure, I'll make sure I send you guys a good scan uh, when it's done. Uh, I will probably also um, post a few videos on Instagram. Uh, of the work in progress, like I'm doing. Uh, there's another piece that I posted just before that one that I'm really excited about because I'm doing it bits by bits. It's like a, a pan panoramic <laughs> of most of the Marvel heroes from the from the 70s, 80s, and uh, I'm gonna draw each character separate. Uh, they're all gonna be available for sale. But I'm gonna spin them, them together into that long banner type of illustration. Uh, in the end. Yeah. yeah, that's gonna be. I started with Black Goliath, but I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the smaller one in the background, smaller ones in the background. I'm gonna draw maybe as a cluster of characters on one same uh, page. Uh, but the ones that are as big as Goliath, uh, Black Goliath. I'm going to draw independently, separately on page. So whoever has an interest on the character in that rendition uh, can uh, inquire about, you know, the availability of the piece and stuff like that. Yeah, so plenty of awesome stuff coming up from Stefan mm -hmm. and available. And too. more that I can't really talk about right now. But eventually in the weeks or months to come, there will be some, uh, there'll be some uh, announcements made. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Safan, and um, I'll, you and I will talk after about when you're going to be uh, on the next show. Uh, greatly appreciate it. Thanks, everyone, for tuning it's always, in. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, guys, for, for dropping by, and, uh, yeah, that's it's always a blast. Awesome. Have a good night, guys. Bye, guys. <laughs>